Discussing today's topics from an African American perspective, this is Another View. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Some news before we get started with the Another View Roundtable. Next Friday, August the 19th, Another View will be live from Fort Monroe. We will commemorate the anniversary of the landing of the first Africans in America as part of the 2019 commemoration of the beginning of our country, 400 years of history. Now, I'll give you more details on the live broadcast and how you can participate later on in the show. But first, let's welcome our panelists. Roger Chesley is a columnist with the Virginian Pilot, and you can read his column every Tuesday Thursday and Saturday. Hey, Roger. Hello, Barbara. How are you? I hope you're staying cool, Barbara. I'm trying. It's hot out there. <laughs> <laughs> Carol Pretlow is a political science professor with Norfolk State University. Hey, Carol. Hi, Barbara. You enjoying your time off? Oh, it's marvelous. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Bill Thomas is our community activist. Hey, Bill. Hey, Barbara. I'm going to talk to you about history when we get out of here. A <laughs> statement you made is not correct. Well, okay, and we'll 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 debate. Is that, that. okay? There's not yeah. no oh, debate yeah. to it. Oh, There's yeah. right and wrong. Okay, we'll talk about that in just a moment. All right. Gee, and yeah. author, journalist, and talk show host Will Levis, who was trying desperately to get here to the studio, but uh, the traffic said no, so he's joining us by phone. Hey, Will, how are you? Hi, uh, how you doing, Barbara? Appreciate your mercy. <laughs> <laughs> no, no problem. So before I let Bill scour me on something no, that no, I no, said, we'll talk about it later. Okay, we can talk about it later. Fine, fine. A lady like okay. you? Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> Lovely? Oh my goodness. I'm trying to be a good boy. <laughs> Bill, okay. What what was wrong? We'll the talk about it later. The four hundred years. <laughs> oh, Excuse me. The, what was wrong? the first African landed in America? Yeah, the first the first landing. That for for comfort. No, that's not true. That's not true. No. Okay. First Africans landed in Spain. Spain <laughs> I mean, excuse me, in Florida. We're so talking the, about to Virginia. The first Africans you didn't say to that. land then I apologize. Thank Let you. me say it absolutely correcting corrected. The first Africans to land here in Virginia, 1619, correct? Are in England-controlled territories in the continent of North America. Yes, sir. Correct. Thank you. I appreciate oh, I that. I love doing that. that. And not, and in, not Jamestown up in North. No, it was nobody. We're not talking time. about Jamestown. At that time, it was called Jamestown. It was, See, it, it, and, Jamestown. Exactly. Mind your own and business. We're talking about at, something else. It's at Fort Comfort, which is now Fort Monroe. Can we move on to today's show? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm just so joyous to be here today. <laughs> so the first thing that I want to talk about is the fact that, and I'm sorry, I got to brag a little bit. Yes. Another view came home with the gold. <laughs> Good for you. We won a uh, Salute to Excellence Award at the National Association of Black Journalists and National Association of Hispanic Journalists uh, Conference, which was last week in Washington, D.C. So this well, is a well, that's national- a cheerleading program for Mrs. Clinton? The che- it was not a cheerleading program for Mrs. Clinton, and we're going to talk about that. <laughs> Because that was something that was very interesting, actually. Oh, how did Donald Trump do when he came there? Thank you. Oh, exactly. Oh, yeah. He did not right. come. Okay. But, um, Con- at congratulations, any rate. Barbara. It was yeah. well deserved. Thank you, Will. We appreciate you that. And Lisa and Eric. And Eric. And Eric, yes. Eric, Eric for yes. the Claville Report. And it um, it was very wonderful to be among our colleagues um, from all across the country. Good for you. And have the show recognized. So, but you know, you guys make it, make it work. So let's get to our first topic. Uh, Department of Justice released the scathing report about the policing methods of my hometown, Baltimore Police Department. The findings include unconstitutional stops and arrests, discrimination against African Americans, excessive force, retaliation for activities protected by the First Amendment, gender bias and sexual assault, and a need for better training and more accountability. Now, the police department asked for this report after the death of Freddie Gray and or the study of them. And its release comes after the, dis- the dismissal of all the charges against the officers involved in the Freddie Gray case. Um, I listened to the news. I heard a gentleman say on air, Roger, um, wow, finally somebody else figures out what we've known forever. And, and I think that that was a lot of the, re- uh, the focus of the report um, was vindication for a lot of the African-Americans who live in Baltimore, and there there were two things um, specifically. One, if you're black, and two, if you're poor. And if you're poor and black, you are under the the feet of many of the officers on uh, on the streets there in the city, and it seemed like it didn't matter the race of the officer. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, there is a large percentage, I think it's about 42% of the sworn officers in Baltimore are black. black. Mm -hmm. And so we're talking about... uh, 
folks who often felt like they were under siege and and have been saying this um and you know the freddie gray uh incident the his his death in police custody brought a lot of this to the fore for for people nationally but this is no news whatsoever to the people who live in Baltimore. And they said that 44% of all the stops that they made occurred in two small, predominantly African-American neighborhoods that contain only 11% of the city's population, Carol. I think the question that I had is that even before Freddie Gray, shouldn't they have or wasn't there some way of investigating the numbers? Don't, uh, don't police departments get... Uh, reviewed, say, on a yearly or a two-year basis so that they can track what has happened, who it has happened to, why it has happened, what mistakes were made? Well, I I think one of the issues um, that the Justice Department said in its findings was there was no accountability. Mm -hmm. Even though the the officers were doing this, there was no sense of they were going to be penalized for doing or, or charged with crimes for anything that they were doing. Right. And it's a part of the culture of the of that police department, unfortunately. But the police department comes under the state and see mm-hmm. No the police department uh, city. Com- comes under the city. But the city, the city mm-hmm. is a part of the state system and so at some point I would have assumed that it would have well, trickled I think down that from mo- investigation. Most police departments, um, my understanding from working with the Prince George's County Police um, in Maryland, who, who has been under a They're consent horrible. decree for a long, hmm. long time, um, but until there are enough complaints and so forth that the, that the federal government gets involved, they don't routinely go in and evaluate a police department. Well, so somebody's got to ask for it. And, and I think one of the things that was most disturbing to me in, in reading through Parts. Uh, the report is online for anybody who wants to read it. Yeah. It is some of the the facts in there are just simply devastating and shocking. And th- there were all these stops of pedestrians on the street. And the report said that only 3.7 percent of pedestrian stops resulted in officers issuing a citation or making an arrest. So the overwhelming, almost all the time, they're stopping people on the street. But no, they are basically to... angry a whole segment. Of the population. Yes. Now, you're not going to get any tips about crimes that are going to be taking place. You're, you're going to be a pariah to a whole mm-hmm. uh, class of people in the city. What, why did it persist in these policies for so long? Well, yeah. you want to chime in? I guess my answer to that would be because it's really not about protecting and serving. It's about uh, driving numbers in terms of arrests and police departments you know, from the commissioner handing down to the troops who's getting his cues from the mayor mm-hmm. who's handing that the initiative down to say hey i want a certain amount of numbers to say that we're tough on crime and we're um keeping uh people in their place and keeping things under control because it has economic and political benefits from it so the the low-hanging fruit are those who are the most vulnerable and the least powerful. So if you're poor and you're black, you fall into that category. You're the most vulnerable and least powerful. And so uh, those who are in power, this is what systemic racism and classism is about. Those who are in power take advantage of that. They take off the low-hanging fruit instead of focusing on root causes that would really uh, make the city better. They do what they want to do to boost their own political agendas and economics. And I, I think the point that Roger brought up about the fact that these are not white officers, these are all the officers, officers that, mm-hmm. um, that are participating in there. Um, Bill, react to this uh, statistic. African Americans accounted for 95 percent of 410 individuals stopped at least 10 times from 2010 through 2016. And I mean, can you imagine? No, I, I absolutely can imagine. The The most disappointing cruise of my life has been cruising through intersections with police officers. We hated them back with Bull Connors when they used dogs to attack children and beat us down and used the law to literally beat the living daylights out of us. And today, it doesn't matter what school your children went to. If they're male, and both of mine have been stopped for no reason whatsoever, simply because they were black. So it crosses racial lines, edu- everything you want to be in America, it doesn't matter. The only thing that you can tell, actually, my son, who's a pretty big kid, 6'5", and 
Mm-hmm. Went to best schools in the world, boarding schools and things. I didn't let him leave the house. I made him when he came back from college. I let him keep him here because he's just too hot headed. And I just said, son, you you can't do this. I mean, you can't go to. He lives in Baltimore now, or you can't go wow. to D.C. where you live. Mm-hmm. You can't do this. Mm-hmm. They will. So I had him work a little job with me for a year. Calm down. There is a, the police chief, um, Kevin Davis, mm-hmm. um, and I actually worked together when I worked for the um, Prince George's County Police. Mm-hmm. And I know Kevin to be a very fair um, and um, and a good good man. Mm-hmm. Um, and But I think one of his big, biggest challenges, and I think any police department that goes under these consent decrees, is really changing mindset. Right. And you can change policy, but right. how do you change mindset? Right. You, have right. to ch- you have to change mindset. You have to change culture. And that really has to come from not so much from the top down. It has to come from the bottom, bottom up. up. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're talking about people. Yeah. The chief is not out there on a day-to-day basis. Right. It's patrol on the street. It's, it's the patrol officers who are doing there. And if you get the chance, uh, I, I urge you to read a piece by uh, Jerry Bembry, a good friend of mine. Mm-hmm. Um, it, he's worked at the Baltimore Sun and is now writing for The Undefeated. Um, and oh. he talks about his his days in Baltimore, about how many times that he would stopped, and most a lot of what he did almost immediately when he would be stopped by police is say, "I am a reporter for the Baltimore Sun," okay. and that would cut a lot of nonsense out mm-hmm. from the uh, so from the police officer. He had to let him know right <laughs> yeah. up front. But he said, well, you know, a lot of people couldn't do that, right. and and a lot of people. Like, he was a young man at the time, and it it, it it was just astounding how many times he got stopped for nonsense yeah. and, well, Barbara, and was never charged. Go ahead, Will. Well, Barbara, there also has to be incentives for them to change the culture from the bottom up because what happens, and I've said it on this show before, it's not a popular thing to say, but like you pointed out in those stats, there's a lot of black officers who are participating in that mm-hmm. same cultural mindset. And mm-hmm. unfortunately, there are a lot of black officers that are like, for example, like Roger's dad, who was a who was a uh, a cop in D.C. Mm-hmm. who went in to serve to make a difference and mm-hmm. and really cared about his people. I've got plenty of friends in New York, and there are plenty who are officers in New York. There are plenty of officers on the Baltimore force who want to be that way as mm-hmm. well. But but the culture and the mindset is you know you do what you need to do to get along, and when you try to make that kind of stand you oftentimes become a target right. from your own compatriots. Right. We've, right. we've experienced that as journalists in the newsroom. Mm-hmm. Yes. If you try to make a stand against certain things like that, you got your own compatriots, people who, your own folk, who will do the bidding of attacking you and making sure that you are not the one who is who is making a change because they want to maintain the status quo. Because, again, it fits their own personal economic and political agenda, and that's and that's a crying shame because there's a lot of people who have sacrificed, died, went to the front lines to make a difference, opened up doors, and then these then these folks come in and they have no appreciation for what their true role is. Yeah, and that's and that's my point. The leadership, the political leadership in Baltimore is African American. Now, totally. Now. Exactly. I mean, now, now, now right you know now. I mean, because it, you, we got to understand that this history is, of, is of goes all the way back. Gone, right, all the way back. Been for but a long but time. you would you would suspect that once one of our children or one of our whatever got in that position, that this mentality would be broken and it wouldn't be tolerated. For the same reason that Will is suggesting in the newsroom or in the police station that things continue to happen because we don't use the moral authority once we get the power to effectively make changes. I, I think it's. I think it's difficult to do so also when you're fighting against a whole structure that's been in place for decades mm-hmm. at a time. It, you know, it's been in place for decades. It's not going to change overnight. It's going to be a, a long, hard slog to, to make some that. of the changes you need to do. Let's talk to Damon in Norfolk. Hi, Damon. You're on the air. Hi, good afternoon. Good Long afternoon. Fan. So I'm a white male. Uh, three, uh, three years ago, I was arrested for, you know, a felonious weapon possession and purchased because there's a like administrative mix up with the state police. So the Norfolk city police came to arrest me and just the whole incident was just terrible. Mm. And they wouldn't let me speak. They wouldn't explain anything to me and just being, you know, just ugly. And I ended up being in jail and everybody encountered was being terrible to me, you know, and I, and in hindsight, you know, got it all figured out. But if I'd been black, how much worse that situation would have been. Wow. And, 
you know, there's just this pervasive culture of, you know, interactions with the police department of guilty until proven innocent and kind of kind of distancing themselves from that public servant role that they, you know, say they have and to protect and serve. It's just everybody's automatically guilty. Like I said, that happened three years ago. Every time I've had an incident, you know, where I interact with law enforcement or even my wife, but that record comes up and they'll ask me, do you have weapons on you? Mm. Well, we need to search you. And it's, and like I said, if I was black, just how much worse that whole situation would be. And now that's changed my attitude towards law enforcement where I'm, I avoid it. You know, because I, I just don't want to. I just don't want to have the interaction, right. I, yeah. and I don't want to put myself through it. And I, and like I said, now in this this day and age, the militarization of the police and just how it's almost elitist they seem now. And there's some great cops out there, but just right. like you're saying, this hey, Damon, that permeates. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Prior to this happening to you, did you have a very different perspective? about police uh, policing and interaction, number one. And number two, as you heard about what was happening with African Americans and police, did you kind of blow it off then versus how you feel about it now? Is, did, it, did that change, in other words? Absolutely. You know, spending, you know, eight hours in the city jail and then not being told anything. And I had just come off a deployment with special operations where I was carrying a weapon every day and, and doing the job. I had a lot of friends that are cops, and I wanted to, you know, maybe look into being a cop. And I grew up in an area that's predominantly white, always had positive interactions with the cops. So when I hear about, you know, interactions with blacks on the news, I was like, you know, how can that be possible? Because I have this different perspective. Mm-hmm. So, of course, in the media, you know, of course, there's going to be this uproar with Black Lives Matter because people just don't know because a lot of white people just aren't being arrested and having negative interactions with the police. So, of course, my perspective changed drastically after that. (laughs) You know what, Damon? We really appreciate your honesty. Thank you so much for that call. We appreciate it. So, you know, the thing that I think about is is when my six-year-old granddaughter says, Grandma, the police aren't good. You know, she's already got that in her head. Mm -hmm. Um, She lives in Baltimore, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But um, I wonder how we get when we talk about we're going to do community policing and we're going to get out and get to know the community oh. and so forth, is it almost too late for that? I mean, I don't, I don't know where they go from here. Well, I, I don't yeah. think it. Go ahead. Go ahead, Will. Will. No, I was gonna I was gonna agree that I don't think it's I don't think it's too late. Again, as someone as a reporter who covered police and had that mindset after gra- uh, growing up in Brooklyn, New York, which is. You know, just like a neighborhood that was just like West Baltimore, my neighborhood, Brownsville, mm-hmm. <clears throat> that I had that mindset where I felt that way about police. And then after covering them and spending time with these officers and spending time with the ones who really did and do want to protect mm-hmm. and serve, it changed my perspective. And I started to see what those particular officers are often up against mm-hmm. in trying to deal within their own precincts, within their own shops within this <clears throat> this pervasive mentality. And the thing is, is that it, that's so sad about it, again, coming back to the black officers who do this, is that, you know, we were out at a National Association of Black Journalists and Hispanic Journalists, and one of the things in one of the panel discussions that was talked about was how, you know, police officers are the only people in society who have the power to take away your freedom. They are empowered by law. You know, the President of the United States can't even do that. Mm-hmm. And you you put this kind of power in the hands of a young person who's coming out of the same society that has systemic racism, but they don't have the kind of clarity of protecting and serving and respect, respecting human dignity of all people, regardless of their color. Uh, this is where you this is where you get that, and then they're in an environment where if they try to go against that grain, they're not supported. And they're thinking about their low salary, their mm-hmm. families, trying to yeah. get back home. You know, people start making decisions. And, and it's a tough job, as it is. It's a, mm-hmm. tough it's a job. very tough job. Mm-hmm. So they, really start making, they start making decisions. Hey, hey let, me, let me go to the path of least resistance. And yeah. then, then, then what happens is you have a traffic stop. And a traffic stop, and no one is thinking about the last thing in anybody's mind is that it's going to end up in a death. And that's what happened. That's what but anyhow, this, this is not no. let's beat and talk the police down because, uh, like Roger's dad, and there's a 
10 My million man. other <laughs> police officers that saves our lives and mm-hmm. are out there in the road saving us and taking care of us when we're harmed. They're there to protect us. I, it, yeah. it all goes back in my judgment. And sure, you had bad apples in every kind of intellectual mm-hmm. environment or company environment mm-hmm. you have. It goes back to leadership. We have to have leadership. And I, I think uh, Mayor Alexander is going to be one of those individuals that's going to stand tall and face this the way it should be faced. It's not going to be acceptable. Mm-hmm. So that the good police officers, which are 98.99% of them, can all get on board with the same thing mm-hmm. and just not to say we beat you guys. We love you guys for what you're doing. Just help us clean your mm-hmm. house up so that we can all live in a safe environment where respect and mutual respect is, is appreciated by all. Uh, uh, Carol, yeah, that's, that's and I that's think you're this. right because a few ye- weeks ago I went to a workshop with the police department and Black Lives Matter. It was held in Slova Library. And there were different perspectives and different ways of addressing things. But I was proud that people remained calm and they said this is a, well, one young man said it's like an onion. There are varying levels. There's the educational level, there's the housing level, there's the transportation level. We need to address each of these and we can't just stop now. We've got to continue to have these meetings. So the members of the police department were there, mem- educators were there, the community was there. And I said, this is a good first step. And Absolutely. hopefully it will continue. So the officers in the Freddie Gray case, well, all, all those charges were dismissed. That, that the, They said the prosecutor didn't have enough um, um, uh, information or material to bring forth the charges that she had um, tried to get them on. Here in Portsmouth, though, mm-hmm. former police, um, uh, Portsmouth police officer, former Portsmouth police officer, (laughs) Stephen Rankin, was found guilty of voluntary manslaughter in the killing of 18-year-old William Chapman. The jury recommended a sentence of two and a half years in prison. Rankin is the first one, if I'm not mistaken, of a lot of these high-profile shootings that is actually where the officer has actually um, been given time. Am I right in that, Roger? Uh, I think you're right in that, although I, I think it would be shocking if the officer down in South Carolina who shot and killed the, uh, the the black man who was, who was running. fleeing away from mm-hmm. him. I, I would be stunned if he is not convicted and, and gets some time as, as well. But as I said in the column last week after the conviction, he is just the 13th officer nationwide to be convicted of murder or manslaughter in a jury trial since 2005, uh, according to research by a professor at Bowling Green State University. Mm-hmm. So I think that shows how rare it is for an officer officer to be found guilty and and it's very it's, it's very possible it could be overturned on appeal because his attorneys have made it clear that yeah. they're going to appeal mm-hmm. there were some things that were prevented uh they were prevented from introducing at that first trial uh the, the Portsmouth judge uh, Morrison didn't allow that certain things in about William Chapman and that could be overturned I was I was surprised Partly because of of the uh, in the verdict, partly because of how difficult it is for for such convictions, but also there were so many witnesses that were there who said there was some type of confrontation there between Chapman and the officer, and I and I was also somewhat ambivalent because yeah, the officer, you know, it seemed very harsh for him to kill somebody on basically what started as a shoplifting charge, but what was he supposed to do mm-hmm. after, you know, after the suspect came at him at the, w- at the way he did? And, uh, you know, Prosecutor uh, Ms. Morales right. talked about he brought a gun to a fist fight. Well, he's not supposed to get beat up. I mean, he's supposed to yeah, be able to that. defend himself. And, and so, it, you know, it, it, really, it, it really was a very gray area. It was mm-hmm. really um, – and, and I, I wish – some of the jurors had agreed to to speak. Uh, you know, it's been hard to get some of their uh, identity. Talk. Well, mm-hmm. it's been hard to get their identities. Their identities have been sealed so That's far good. in yeah. the court mm-hmm. record. Mm-hmm. You want to respond? No, back? no, no. I, I just think that uh, the uh, the prosecutor, the young lady in Portsmouth, did an excellent job. I think mm-hmm. that was good. It kept it all the board dealt, dealt with the facts and mm-hmm. things. And and uh, I just think this whole matter has to have better leadership. Mm-hmm. There's no way. And I, I'm all for police officers and all that kind of stuff. There's mm-hmm. no question about it. But I just can't imagine. I wouldn't shoot my dog, I'm telling you, or a dog, well, if, if uh, they were coming at me and I had a gun and they could hurt me. Mm-hmm. 
I would try to do something <laughs> physical with that situation as not to take a life. It's well, not worth it. You got to have he, some common sense but now. He, but he used the taser on him first, oh, and then okay. the taser was knocked out of his hands. And he said, on the I, I listened to the direct examination of Rankin and the cross examination of Rankin, and. You know, one of the things he said was police policy says that you go after you use right. that, that, that that level, level. Right. of defense or that level of, uh, you know, his taser. He was not supposed to go next to pepper spray. He's supposed right. to go That's to something true. higher. Yeah. Wow. Absolutely. If you're just joining us, it's the Another View Roundtable with Roger Chesley of the Virginian Pilot, Carol Pretlow of NSU, community activist Bill Thomas, and journalist, author, and talk show host Will Leviste. Um, I want to move us on to uh, Donald Trump and um, Hillary Clinton. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> now, Bill, you were at the Republican uh, convention. I was an elected delegate from the 3rd District and mm-hmm. served mm-hmm. my people, I think, very, very well. Well, since there were only 18 African Americans in the whole conference, we were looking <laughs> for you. Zero, zero, and one percent. <laughs> and Steve Colbert, all of the people, <laughs> Mike, Chris Wallace, I said, no, 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 thank you. We, we were looking for we you. Will, <laughs> we will, we will not. Uh, my hey, daughter would not 18? have... Did that 18 include the people who were serving? Oh, <laughs> oh that's not even that's right. Not, no, well. that's just, uh, now, now, I mean, Will, now, Will, you were at the Democratic convention. Is that correct? Yes, I was. Yeah. I was uh, there as a uh, reporter for my show, yep. Okay, so you were there reporting for your show. So as I when I went to NABJ last week, I was listening to the Baltimore um public radio station at Morgan State University. And the one of the professors was talking about his experience taking students, student journalists, mm-hmm. uh, to both conventions and the stark difference that he felt in the way that he was treated at um, the Republican convention versus the way he was treated at the Democratic convention. He said at the Republican convention that the students were given top treatment, that mm. that. Uh, interviews were brought over to them that um, they were fed that they were felt made to feel welcome um, wow. and so forth and that when they got to the democratic convention it was more of a we just take you guys for granted and we know you're mm-hmm. going to vote democrat so therefore we don't have to go out of our way to make mm-hmm. anything happen I'm, I'm curious from Bill and Will's perspectives um, what you think about that well from Cleveland just from a sense of location uh, it was totally isolated in a very confined area. So once you got through all the security, which was enormous, mm-hmm. with 10 feet high fences and all those kinds of things, you couldn't go back and forth. I mm-hmm. think the, in, the, uh, the, the other situation was they were having it outside in the football arena that's completely outside of Philadelphia. So that probably gave a little of logistics. But if you got through the logistics of getting into behind the gates mm-hmm. in Cleveland, you were okay. Because mm-hmm. they had cordoned off like nine blocks of Cleveland, wow. and with ten feet high fences, wow. and so you were you were locked down. You couldn't go anywhere. So I think it's a matter of logistics, as I've been told by some students that went to mm-hmm. the event in Philadelphia. It was just a very, was very more... hard to get into, and the logistics didn't work well. You weren't in downtown Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. You were outside. You had to take a bus or drive a car, and all that stuff was impossible. Mm-hmm. So, Will, do you think that that the Democrats do take the African American vote for granted? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, from a journalistic standpoint, um, I didn't feel any of that kind of neglect, mm-hmm. so to speak. And I think that logistics could have been part of it. In, in Philadelphia, you had part of the convention was at the convention center, and a lot of the hotels and people were staying was downtown Philadelphia. And then what a lot of people saw on television, Bill correctly said, was um, at the at the stadium. Mm-hmm. And I didn't feel sort of confined in any way. Uh, from a voter's standpoint, I think there, there certainly is a taken for granted, especially um, in who the Republicans are running as a candidate mm-hmm. now. And you hear the polls saying that uh, Donald Trump has little to no, you know, 1% or less American support. And I think that, in my in my personal opinion, I think that this is actually an opportunity for the Congressional Black Caucus, for other leaders, political leaders in the black community, to really get some substantive um, um, guarantees from 
the Democratic Party and the and the candidate. In fact, one of the conversations I had was with Bobby Scott and also uh, Lionel Spruill and Mamie Locke as mm-hmm. members of the Congressional Black Caucus and also Virginia Black Caucuses about this, this very issue that for all of these years, you know, a lot of the issues that the Black Caucus is supposed to be championing on the on the part of Black uh, Black Americans haven't really been addressed and been taken for granted. And they've been speaking out against about it as well. You my, her earlier this year, Louise Lucas, mm-hmm. uh, very, very much was outspoken. Uh, the senator about from Virginia, it. from right. the state of state senator of Virginia, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. very outspoken about not feeling that she's even being heard by her own colleagues. So I think the Black Caucus should really be fighting and say, hey, uh, this is going to be a tight race, and we need some guarantees because the, the Black vote is going to be critical to uh, to um, uh, Hillary Clinton winning. Um, Carol, do you think that because of the divisiveness with, with Donald Trump and, and how America is feeling and so forth, Talk to us about why it is more critical than ever that African Americans vote this time. Because you hear a lot of people saying, "I'm just not voting." Well, because why is that important? I don't think you can win by default, and I think that many of the issues that confront the black community don't go from the top down; they go from the bottom up. So, not only is voting for president important, but also that person's ability to negotiate with Congress becomes very important. So their vote is not just the top. It also has implications from the bottom up Mm -hmm. as well. Um, I have heard people say, I'm just not voting. I don't like Trump and I don't like Hillary. And I'm like, so you're losing by default. Why, Why would you not Look at the issues very carefully. Now there is no excuse. One time we were locked into the newspaper deal, but now you can go online and look at what the um, perspectives are, what the philosophies are, and what the issues are, and then assess and say, okay, this is how I'm voting. But, Roger, is anybody talking about the issues? I mean, I know nope. this week they came well, out with well, their uh, 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 economic packages. I, I, but th- I think one of the <laughs> candidates has tried to talk about the issues, but she is pretty much getting drowned out by the coverage that Donald Trump has gotten almost from day one since he announced. And it's it's uh, the news cycle is almost always about him. And so it's really hard, I think, for her to break through that. Um, I, I think at one point she was trying to see if she could, pl- she could play a kind of running out the clock uh, issue and see if she could just do it that way. Uh, uh, smartly, I think she's trying to get her policies and platforms and and say her differences between the two. I would surely hope that everybody does vote so that you can say you have a stake in this election, not just for the president, but for Congress. And in certain cities, Mm -hmm. they're going to have city council elections in the fall. Some cities do, some cities don't. Um, So, yeah, it's important, even if you are uh, disenchanted, but to kind of paraphrase, uh, I think, was it Cheney or Rumsfeld, we go with the, the army that we have. Well, these are the two major party candidates so, I mean, this is what you have, and so you have to go with that. Go ahead, Carol. Oh, and even when you're looking between the lines for what was said and what wasn't said, for example, if you look at Mr. Trump's uh, economic policies, then you say, well, he didn't address it. You look at what he said and begin to question, okay, who's going to pay for this? How is this going to work? And it is incumbent upon us to ask the questions to ourselves and our organizations as to let's analyze this even further. So, Bill, when when Donald Trump says things like the president and Hillary Clinton are the founders of ISIS, I mean, (laughs) give me a break. (laughs) I'm I'm really trying to understand, and and I'm curious as to how you have all these Republicans who are now um, saying we're going to go help Hillary win. We're going over to the other side. I mean, what happened? Washington, and, and I think our electoral process has been broke since 1989. This is just the culmination of all this stuff. Three things I think that are, that are absolutely true. Washington's broken. Number two, we don't have the leadership to take us where we need to go. And then we need for someone to speak for the people that are being disenfranchised. Uh, and, and neither one of them are doing that. I, and I think you have to, but I have to look at it that way because it's just such – 
I would have never thought in my years of life that I would get into an environment where it was just totally, totally isolation of economic, educational, and just outright mental racism mm -hmm. on both sides. I, I just never saw it. It's just unbelievable. We, we can't make progress because none of us are doing the kinds of things that needs to be done. Nobody's really talking about what really needs to be done. And, and it's to me, it's not that difficult. I understand the politics of it all, and I understand why he's saying what he's saying and why she's doing what she's doing, just mm -hmm. for pure politics. But as either one right now, and I would say that even where I am today, talk to, to America. But as a delegate, I mean, don't you uh, – did that do anything to you in terms of, of uh, how, how you defend <laughs> the person that the party selected? I don't defend people. Okay. I defend ideas and principles. Okay. So And so what are his ideas and principles that I'm really trying to understand, yeah. seriously. Uh <laughs> gotta put me in a Good spot. That's not really a spot. The, the the issue really becomes I'm not dealing with the people. I never have. I'm mm -hmm. I'm supporting what I think is the best route, the best system to take us where we need to go. Okay. And I think that's the free enterprise system. I well, truly, well, I truly believe. Well, I'm coming to you. I truly believe that um, Washington is broken. I, I love S Scott Rigel. I think he's a great gentleman, and I'll stand behind him in what he said. But he didn't do enough. If he doesn't like Mr. Trump and he doesn't want Mr. Trump to win, then he should go all the way Meaning? and figure out a way how to get somebody else or start a new plan. And we're going to do something new in four years. Not yeah. just to go to status quo. I love Scott. He's a good guy, principal guy, and everything else. Well, well he's well, gone for he's gone for a third party candidate. candidate. Uh, may as well yeah. be voting yeah. for Hillary Clinton as far as I'm concerned. You say that, and and uh, that's just the numbers. Well, I was going to say, Barbara, is that I mean the way it works, and those of us who spent some time covering campaigns, and I know Carol knows this as a political scientist, is that in campaigns, I mean they do a lot of polling, research, and they identify, okay, what is going to resonate with uh, our voters? Because the name of the game is getting your own people to come out and vote. And so they look at what what messages resonates with the, the voters who we need to come out. So Trump, to his credit, has added a lot of new potential voters into the system, and they are – very much on an anti-Hillary uh, sort of bent. So he's speaking to that. So it's illogical that some of the things that he said, and me personally, I, 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 I'm in the camp of people who don't really believe that he really, truly wants to become president. He's as surprised that he's gotten this far as a lot of us. But I think the polling and his research that his team has identified says that this kind of messaging is what is going to inspire and bring the people from out from his camp out to vote to bring them over the top. Now on the other side, it's the same mission. You got to bring out your own, get your own people to come out and vote. So they their research is indicated to them a certain kind of messaging, and that's what you're seeing Hillary Clinton do, and that's what it comes down to. You know that they're they're doing the messaging. That is going to get their own people I, out to vote. Just one quick okay, question. Hold on. No, no, no. Go ahead, Bill. That's old politics. The politics today is the independent voters. Trump has his people lined up, and they're going to vote for Trump. Hillary Clinton has her people, and they're going to vote for her. The issue right now is that yellow line that they show on all those graphs and all those polls they do, the independent voter is going to make the difference in this election because everybody else has drawn sides. Now, Mr. Trump, you would think that he would be doing polling and sensitivity that's, and marketing-driven things. If he was doing that, then he wouldn't be doing what he's doing. He couldn't be doing what he's doing because his margin of victory is going to be with independent voters. Okay, let's yeah, talk to Kelly Anderson in Suffolk. Hi, Kelly. You're on the air. Um, I'm, I'm calling as a white woman who has voted Republican all my life, and I've just— um, recently made public my intentions to vote for Hillary Clinton to go all the way, just as your, um, your guest said. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm calling because I've had friends that are close to me, black friends, express that they actually feel fear this year with Trump. And that's what I fear 
um, for our minorities specifically. And I just wondered if your guests could talk about that, if that is something. What are they saying that they fear? Um, well, I think what struck me most is as a, a younger woman who's very apolitical, who I've known for a long time, is that this is the first time in America where she's felt afraid to be a black woman. And because hmm. of uh, what she sees stirred up by the Trump campaign, um, the, the hate talk, um, whether it's at rallies, um, whether it's his, his policies. And, and I really feel for that, too. I felt like this country was moving forward. And as a Republican, as a white Republican, felt like for years um, we've been saying we're not racist. We don't feel that way. The policies we support are not against the black community, but they're to help the black community. And I feel like what Trump has sadly drawn out of, of my Republican Party is 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 this horrible side and he's proven that what everyone feared about our party is at least to some degree and with some to some extent true and i'm 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 appalled by it and i'm embarrassed by it and 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 i'm scared by it i'm scared what will come out um if people that feel this way are given even a bigger voice and and a presidential uh candidate to our president to reflect it and to uh lead it well, to Kelly, thanks so much for your honesty and for that call. We appreciate that, Roger. Uh, I I think um, one thing I like to say for first of all, Kelly, thank you for those thoughts. I think you said yeah. that better than a, than a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think you articulated uh, you know some of the fear of blacks and whites this year, regardless of party, of uh, who are some of the people that are supporting Trump. And New York Times did a long, uh, you know, follow with a camera over uh, several months. Some of the people showing up at Trump rallies and campaigns, some of the statements, some of the confrontations, and that really showed a very ugly side of America mm-hmm. in in wow. that footage. But secondly, I do want to make this point. You know, there, there have been kind of a pox on both houses about you know Hillary's bad and Trump is bad, and I just want to say it's not really a comparison. You've got one who's actually done things in government. You know. Good or bad, right or wrong, who has done things in government? Uh, you know, Trump has made so many statements about lying Hillary. Yeah, there are a lot of politicians who don't tell the whole truth all the time. A lot of the stuff that has come out of Mr. Trump's mouth are just off the top of his head and lies. Mm-hmm. He he has not released his taxes. There's, yeah, there's certain things. There's, <laughs> no, no presidential candidate. Has has not has released not the taxes. He doesn't and have for, to. for several for several years. He hasn't done anything in the political sphere in terms of actually running anything. He is shown to be unhinged. Anything you want to say about Hillary, she at least has a resume that's out there in the public sphere of running, of doing things in government. I just don't get this this false equivalence between the two candidates, and I think it's just crazy. It's, it's not Bill? a false equivalency. It is. The, it is. the <laughs> issue, like it or not, the press, and I'm just not calling you guys the liberal press, it is horrible. I mean, you guys, I'm going to talk in the vernacular, have taken little things and just have blown it out of proportion. Same little as Little pres- things. Bill, I mean, it's Bill, just, he doesn't Bill. talk political. That is correct. And he should talk political. Because that is politics. I understand all of that. But a lot of these things that you're that the press is putting out there and the slant that these liberal people are telling folks, I'm not afraid of Donald Trump any more than I'm afraid of Putin. I, you know, it doesn't matter because I know I'm an individual with individual rights and I know how to protect them. What I think he's saying is what I'm agreeing with is that the federal government is broken. And people like Hillary Clinton and others and Bush and some others have driven us to this state of being. And it needs to be changed. It okay. needs to go a different okay. way. Hold on. Like Roger. a broken okay. clock. Wait a minute, wait a minute, Will. Like, like a broken clock. Uh, Twice a day okay. you can be right. And so he has made some statements that have been correct. There are problems with the federal government. There are problems with the way the government works. I have never in my lifetime, 56 years old, I have never heard 
a political candidate for president suggests that the opponent be shot dead. He did it's not what, do that. He, he, he's what he said this week. Tell me, what He is what he said wait, this wait, week. Wait, wait. He did say it, Bill. He did say it. He might not have used those exact well, words, but he, no, 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 but he did he say Wait a minute. Let, let me finish this. Let no, me finish no, no, this. Wait, wait, you wait. You had two Kennedys. You had two Kennedys write an op-ed this week opposing this vehemently of what his comments and what his suggestions are. You don't do that if you are trying to run, Roger, if you're trying to be the president of the go, U.S. Roger, tell me okay. when he said what you just said. He, Give me the he point, said, reference he said and comments point about when you the said Second you Amendment. Shot dead. He said comments about the Second Amendment. No, that no, can no, no, only no. be That can only be inferred In your mind. that he was. No, no, no. no, no. Bill, Bill, come, come on now. Come, come on, on now. Oh, You've got a brain to think with. You know what he was saying. No, no, I do not. You don't have a brain to think with. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait, but he didn't say what you said, Roger. That's Will, what I'm saying. Will, Will. Yeah, I was going to say ahead. that. I, that um, you know, I never totally agree with Bill or Roger on anything, but I, I actually lean on on Bill's side on this because Roger, in a sense, just made his point, and that is that the whole Trump phenomenon is an indictment on the media as well. Thank because you. Because a, the media didn't see him coming. So B, if Neither you go the back Republican to the call, party, that's true too. no, but but it's an indictment on the entire political process, which includes the media. So if you go back to the caller's comment, the feeling was that we are moving forward as a country. Why? Because we got an African American president, two termer, and all of that. But along the way, there has been an undercurrent of people who have been continued to remain very angry about government, very angry and agitated on issues of race. So where was the media in this? Where was the media in the, the fact that black wealth, and, and we were just talking earlier about uh, blacks dying at the hands of police. Okay, we got 30 was, seconds left the in the show, Will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are out of time. I cannot believe. We didn't even no, get to gotta, some of the topics, but I knew this was We can't let this go here. Well, we are going oh, to go, no. talk about politics from now through and through the election, <laughs> and so we will be able to continue well, this agree. conversation. Are you kidding me? This can't stop. <laughs> because <laughs> <laughs> so next month we will continue this conversation and whatever else happens to be happening in the news, and we will be right back. Hi, I'm LaShawn Merritt, and if you want to discuss the issues and celebrate the successes of the African-American community, listen to another view on 89.5. Mr. LaShawn Merritt, who is running tonight in the men's 400 meter, and uh, we didn't even get to the Olympics, but everything's just been fabulous about (laughs) that. The Virginia Stage Company has a zesty new project called The Line, Art for Social Change. It's a unique way for the Hampton Roads community to discuss social issues. Our Lisa Godley gives us an up-close view at how The Line is getting folks actively involved by allowing them to use their voices to create awareness. James Baldwin's play, Blues for Mr. Charlie, takes a hard look at the nation's racial divide, specifically how a white man is able to murder a black man without punishment. Loud Britain come to the door. What did he say? You ready, boy? Are you ready, boy? No, I ain't ready. I got a record to play and a drink to finish. Baldwin wrote Blues for Mr. Charlie in 1964, But decades later, many of the same fears and misunderstandings that plagued American society back then still exist. This is why the Virginia Stage Company partnered with the Virginia Center for Inclusive Communities to cross what continues to be a painful divide. Tommy Coleman works with VSC's Education and Community Engagement Division. It was two years ago, and a lot of what we were talking about was Michael Brown and residual effects of Trayvon Martin, everything that resulted in young black men being killed by police or being turned into monsters. And that was the reason we did choose Blues for Mr. Charlie, because it was a response to Emmett Till. And I'm like, this is exactly what we want to say in art form. Mr. Lyle? Good night, Joel. Mr. Lyle! Richard! And I never saw that boy again. 
I feel like sometimes there's not as many open conversations about racism or economic inequity unless they're behind closed doors or in certain circles of people. But we are living in an age where there's so much information and people still aren't using it. VSC's Kat Martin agrees. We are relatively all equal in terms of the law, but we all know that that's not actually the case within our social interactions. There are no signs and windows right now telling you people can't go places. But there is a boundary. There are ways that you feel when you walk into a space, and space can be coded for race. The line gives participants an opportunity to investigate the racial divide without being preachy. It's not going to be a sit down and we talk at you. It's going to be a you immerse yourself in it and you talk to us and we talk to you and we talk together and we try to come away from that with something that we've all agreed upon. We will give you the education. We will give you the language. It's up to you how to use it. Mm -hmm. And hopefully you're going to use it to forward momentum and for progression and for positive reasons because that's what this is about. For another view, I'm Lisa Godley. And Lisa's piece was produced by another view intern, Taylor White, a Hampton University junior. By the way, our own Lisa Godley, along with WHRO producer Danny Epperson, are cast members in the production of The Line. The Line will take place on Sunday, August 21st at 3 p.m. at the Slover Library. For more information, check out our website at anotherviewradio.org. Next Friday, Another View will be live at Fort Monroe, the site of the landing of the first Africans in America. And that's what they say, Bill. <laughs> it's the beginning of a weekend full of events commemorating the American Evolution, Virginia to America, 1619 to 2019. This is the kickoff event of a series of activities that over the next four years commemorate key events in 1619 that helped shape America's founding, culminating with the 400th anniversary in 2019. So now is your chance to come and watch us do live radio. Simply join us at the gazebo at Fort Monroe in Hampton at 1130 on Friday, August the 19th. There is limited seating, so you may want to bring a lawn chair and be sure to wear flats because there is a long walk from the parking lot to the gazebo. We'll be right on the water and among our guests will be the new National Park Superintendent for Fort Monroe, Terry Brown. Don't miss the Another View History Lesson live from Fort Monroe. It's absolutely free, so come on out and join us. And that's it for our show today. Our theme music was composed and performed by Jay Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer. Victor Bowen is our audio engineer. And Taylor White answered our phones. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. And come join us live next Friday from Fort Monroe. If you can't make it, we'll see you on the radio next Friday at noon for another view. <laughs>